Right, so question. If you had a time machine, you can go back to your past, anywhere in your past, and change one thing. What would you change? Okay. People are thinking. It can be like last week, last month, or it could be the year 1991. 19. You have something in your mind that you would change? Yes? Something you would say, I wish I could have. I should have done this. I should have avoided that. You have in your head? It's here? Is it a missed opportunity? How many would honestly say, don't say what you're thinking, really, but I just want to show of hands. Who among you would go back in your past to take advantage of a missed opportunity? A missed opportunity, okay. How many of you are honestly thinking, it's a regret that I wish I should not have done, so I'm, I'm going to not do something that I did? Okay, a lot. How many of you are thinking, I still don't know, there's too many. <laughs> Everyone's like, that's me. <laughs> all right, so most of us, I think, if not most, all of us have something like that in our heads, something we should have done but did not, or something we wish we did not do, but we did. Yes? Most of the time when we ask that question, when you watch, have you seen the movie Back to the Future? Uh, if you say yes, your age has been revealed. Okay? <laughs> But uh, it's one of the best movies or one of my favorite movies of all time. And uh, in Back to the Future, he goes back to change a lot of things. And then he thought, if I could just change this part of my life, my, my present would be different. You see, when we think of these things, we think of usually regrets. Agree? It's regrets. It's something that we would usually regret. It's probably a big decision or it could have been a small decision with a ripple effect, right? Or it could be tragedies that we wish uh, we could have changed, prevented, or avoided. So we're going to talk about that today, the sovereignty of God and our role in this life under His sovereignty. We're all in need of wisdom and we all have different seasons in life, agree? And normally, we cannot predict when something will happen. It just happens. How many of you uh, experience this irony? You prepare for something, it doesn't happen. And then the thing you prepared for, or you did not prepare for, it happens when you least expect it. No? Always? <laughs> You're like, man, how come, Lord, the thing I prepared for, kani unta? Because I was so ready. You know, uh, one, one quick example of that, uh, when I graduated from, from Bible school and everything, I thought I was so ready for ministry. I was like, God, when we get into ministry, I know that people are going to ask about predestination and the Trinity and church history, and I'm ready for that. And then you get into ministry, and then the questions of people are life events. What do I do with this? friendship what do I do with this decision in my life I'm like these aren't theological I'm not ready for this it's usually like that no we're all in need of wisdom for different seasons in life and we all have different seasons as individuals we all have we're all going through different things all of us also have the same season as a church family so individually we have our own issues but as a family we, ha we have common issues that we deal with. In your family, it's like that also, diva. Like, if a family member has a big issue that everyone's involved, everyone's going through that, plus their own individual thing. And all of us experience the effects of our wise and not so wise decisions, right? We go through that personally, we go through that corporately. And that's why we have this sermon today. So if you're going to ask, why should I listen today? It's because we all need wisdom. Now, Ecclesiastes was written probably, was most probably written by King Solomon, wisest man in the history of mankind. He was given divine wisdom by God. And if you read the whole book of Ecclesiastes, he calls himself the preacher. And the preacher, or Solomon, expresses many thoughts and insights. And if you read the whole book, it, it sounds very self-contradicting. 
if you just sit down and read it straight, you'll feel like, this guy is so confused. He says one thing now and he says the exact opposite in the very next chapter. Is this guy confused or is there a point here? But when we, if we read it lang as is, it feels confusing. It feels that it's self-contradicting and Solomon doesn't know what he's saying. But if we understand the theme of Ecclesiastes, it perfectly makes sense. And the theme of Ecclesiastes is that God is sovereign and the whole point of life is to fear God and worship God in a fallen or frustrating world. The reason why it, self it sounds self-contradicting is because Solomon talks about the reality of life. And life is complex and life contradicts itself over and over again. Sometimes in seconds, right? we see that in the weather, it's so hot and then it rains. Or it's so hot while raining. And then you're wondering, why is life like this? It's a fallen world. It's frustrating. It's just life. So how do we deal with it? The seeming contradictions are resolved by the theme and by understanding the writing style of Solomon. Because you see, when we read the New Testament, it's spoon-feeding. You notice? It's just doctrine. Here's truth. Here's what's not true. Do this. Don't do that. Here's Jesus. Here's what Jesus is all about. Period. But in the book of Ecclesiastes, he doesn't write that way. The way he writes is what you call open reflection. He's not telling you his conclusions. Instead, he's letting you go through the journey with him. He's forcing the reader to really dwell on the issue, to meditate with him. And sometimes it feels frustrating. When you read Ecclesiastes, you feel like, can you just get to the point, please? And some writers are like that even today. Have you ever read books by a guy named Philip Yancey? Philip Yancey was a, is a writer and he wrote several books. Uh, one of them is entitled Disappointment with God. And then there's another book he wrote called Where is God When It Hurts? And Philip Yancey doesn't just open it with life is full of suffering, here's the answer. But he makes you go through the pain. And then he's a journalist, he's an investigative journalist. So he goes to this place with so much war and he observes it and he says, where is God? Why does God allow this? And you think, bitaw no? And he starts asking questions. Uh, the pain that these children are going through, they're innocent. How could God allow innocence to disappear? And you're like, yeah, bitaw. And throughout the whole book, you just get more and more frustrated. And then he gives you conclusions in the end. Another guy who writes like that, if you're interested in apologetics, is a guy named Lee Strobel. This guy was not only an uh, uh, investigative journalist, his background is in law. So he was a legal investigative journalist and an atheist. And he hated God, he hated religion, and hated all of these things. And he interviewed Christians, many different Christians. And he became a Christian because of that. And if you read his book, The Case for Faith, it's so frustrating at the start of every chapter, why should I believe in God? Because of evolution. And then he gives you all the evolution claims and you start to get frustrated. Bitaw no? If you just read the introduction of every chapter, I guarantee you will lose your faith. <laughs> no kidding. When I re read the book, I'm like, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. It doesn't make sense. And then you continue reading. Bitaw no? Hey, that makes sense. This makes sense. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, I feel my faith is getting more secure. And then, next chapter, I have doubts again. And then, oh, you continue. So, there are some people who write that way. So, the, the reader, I'm sorry, the preacher, Solomon, provokes his listeners and readers. So, today's sermon will be like that. My goal is to frustrate you. Forgive me. But really, uh, the sermon will be uh, partly literal, partly spiritual, and very personal. We'll do it devotional type, and I hope to provoke you into thinking, into meditating, and to really take a good look at your life, every area, and to examine yourself, and to, to find wisdom in God's Word. So, let's get into... Ecclesiastes chapter 3. 
I hope this won't feel like a running commentary, but we'll go slow. So verse 1, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Pause. He says every. Every matter under heaven. Use your imagination for a moment. Every positive experience, every negative experience, there's no escape. Can you, es it's, it's nice on time if we can escape all the negatives, no? Have you seen the movie Click? Stars Adam Sandler. He got this magic remote control and he could just fast forward all the negative experiences and then slow motion all the nice ones. I wish I had that remote. We don't have that. God made sure that we don't have that because God wants us to experience every single event. Happy, sad, great, not so great, disappointing, frustrating, joyful, tearful, everything. Every moment is inevitable. There is no escape and there is no warning. It's the fact of life. We live in a fallen world. We have no choice. So at the onset, Solomon is saying we're helpless. There's a season for everything under the sun. And then he continues in verse Two, he says, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up. He begins with a time to be born and a time to die. There's one foundational truth. Nothing lasts forever. In Bisaya, hashtag, walang forever. Okay, so but really it's true, nothing lasts forever, all things are temporary. We feel that in the temporariness of all the things we do. Have you ever thought about it? You guys uh, know uh, this actor named Keanu Reeves or Keanu Reeves, he was just awarded by the uh, Chinese uh, Association of Martial Arts, so you know they get this plaque and then you put your finger, your, your hand and your feet there and then you sign your name on concrete. And it's going to be added to a long slab of concrete slabs of many different actors have contributed this and that. But in the end, when these celebrities pass away, when they die, as we will all die, what do those plaques really do? Eventually, they will also fade. The plaque falls, they break. If they break, wala na. Life is temporary. We're born, we pass away. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as it's appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment. After death, there is a judgment. We cannot control birth. You agree? Some people are praying so hard to have a baby. Wala pagihapon. You go to all the expert doctors. This doctor is so good. You just visit her and she'll give you all the vitamins. For sure you'll get pregnant. Wala. Others naman, it's so easy for them to get pregnant. It's doubly easy. And you wonder, Lord, why is it like that? Kami nag IVF nami, nag medical whatever nami, nag pa work up nami. Why is it like that? We also cannot control when we die. We cannot choose. Lord, I'm not ready, ha? So, siguro the year 2000, ano pa? Huh? Diba? You strike a deal with God, but God tells you exactly when. We can't control when. We can't control how. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. Literally, we can think of farmers and agriculture. If you plant during a non- planting season, agriculturally, it's a waste of time, right? Certain plants need certain temperatures, certain seasons, di ba? Kung init pa, you can't plant certain seeds or they will dry up. So literally, we can think of agriculture and farmers uh, for business, marketing and holidays. When is the best time to sell roses and chocolates? Ah, so, ang mga nito bag, sakpan. <laughs> that was a trap question. Okay, but really, di ba? When is the best time to sell gifts? Christmas, birthdays, di ba? So different marketing seasons, we can think of those as well. But really, planting and plucking from being planted has more to do with what God is doing. Just as birth and death. 
Same thing. Jeremiah 18 verse 7 says this. God through Jeremiah said, If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy the kingdom. That's what God said. And then he says, But if the nation repents, I might do something different. And I've dis if, if I have decided to plant them firmly and yet they disobey me, I can pluck them out. It's all up to God. It's His choice. It's His prerogative. It's also practical for us because it reminds us of a sobering truth that everything is under His control. We can build companies and businesses. We can build empires. But if God decides no, then it's a no. There's also a time to kill and a time to heal. Normally, when people say a time to kill, wow, people are people are the names of people are in your mind na hmm, <laughs> na oi no oi, that's not what it means. A time to kill has more to do with death penalty, wars, capital punishment, self defense, and not murder. Okay, not murder. Or there's a time to heal. It could be physical. It could be you need to rest because you're sick because bagulang nagsugod ang rainy season. Or it could even be a time of long periods of rest. When uh, more familiar to this are pastors who go through sabbatical or sabbatical leaves. Or it could be people who are just so stressed that for them, oh, I gotta heal. What do you do? Uh, I think I should get out of the country, vacation, diba? All of you, you're like, ah, peace of fair. When is the peace of fair? That is my time. <laughs> diba? It's scheduled. But really, it could also talk about other things. A time to kill and heal could also talk about relationships or friendships. There's a time to heal certain friendships, certain relationships. There's a time to put an end to them. You know, there's a joke about that. Marie Kondo, your friends, thou. But really, there's a time to assess. Is this friendship good for me? Is this friendship uh, giving, uh, uh, giving me influences that spur me towards God? Or is this friendship drawing me away from God and teaching me some very, very terrible things? Is this friend a true friend? It's possible to think of those things. So friendships, relationships. It could talk about dreams. Is this a dream or a hope that I should should kill should i should end this should i say you know this this is a dangerous hope this is leading my heart into idolatry maybe i should kill certain hopes certain aspirations or should i start to heal certain hopes hopes you had in the past and then you weren't able to really do them because of certain circumstances and you realize i can do them now maybe i should maybe i should start okay so there are differences it can be about desires. It could even be your spiritual life. It could be about temptations, and it, it could have to do things uh, to do about repentance. Are there habits that I should kill once and for all? The first thing I do when I wake up is I do this, this, and then that. And the that part is something you know is not really helping your spiritual walk. Or whenever I get home, here here's my routine. Are there parts of your routine that you should stop? you should change or things you should start. I had a relationship with God before where I did this and I have to heal them now. So these are certain things we have to start thinking of. How many of us have accepted this fact of life? That we should always keep assessing ourselves, thinking about what we do, the things that we need to kill, the things we need to heal. Okay? How about this? A time to break and a time to build. Time to break and a time to build. Literally, it's God who decides these events. Remember Jerusalem? It's so interesting with Jerusalem. When God decided to destroy Jerusalem, He did it through Nebuchadnezzar. And then later, God decided to rebuild Jerusalem through Zerubbabel. No matter how many times you try to build something, how many of you have experienced this? You try to start this business, it doesn't work. You try to start something, it doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. You did everything you could. Voila. You've been there? 
And then for some reason, you try it without even putting so much effort. You try something with no effort. You didn't really think about it, but then it succeeds. And you're thinking, Lord, what happened? It's a God thing. Because God is in control. You know, we need wisdom for things that we are to break or to build. It can even be spiritual things. What about your core values, your doctrines, and your foundations? For many of you, or I don't know many or some, I don't really know, but how many of you are thinking, I don't have spiritual foundations? All I know is that Jesus is God, the Bible is God's word, period. Maybe for some of us, we need to solidify our foundations. We need to start thinking of specific things that the Bible talks about. What do I believe in terms of salvation? Can I lose it or not? What do I believe about the sovereignty of God? Is God sovereign or man's will is sovereign? What do I believe about speaking in tongues? What do I believe about prosperity and blessing? What do I believe about uh, modern day prophets saying, thus says the Lord, my son, I have a word for you. Should I believe that or not? What's my position in these things? Doctrinal foundations. These are crucial and important. For others, it's about breaking. I need to break certain beliefs. I need to change certain convictions. Some people think this way, and I was surprised. Uh, many years ago, I was speaking to a friend of mine who's a Christian and a business person, and, or acquaintance, and he said this. Bro, I know we're Christians, but it, when it comes to business, we should do business the Chinese way. And I'm like, could you define Chinese way? And he started defining it, and I said, wait, 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 huh? What you're saying is, we're a Christian when it comes to all, all our lives, all areas of our lives, except when we do business, when we suddenly are more Chinese than we are Christian? That doesn't make sense to me. We're Christians first. And so, after that conversation, he began thinking, Bitao, no? I need to break a mindset. Because that's how I've always done business, so I just never thought about changing it. So we need to break certain mindsets as well. And we have to break mindsets in business, in our relationships, in our friendships, in how we relate with our colleagues, so many different things. How about verse 4? A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. Let's take a look at all of them. First, a time to weep slash mourn and a time to dance slash laugh. You see, we often think that these seasons are ruled by emotions. Agree? I feel sad, I cry. I feel happy, I laugh. Emotions. But the truth is, that's not the case. These seasons are not driven by emotions. These seasons are driven by self-control. You see, yes, we experience death, tragedy, we experience life and favor. But how we respond is up to us. How many times have you heard this phrase? It's not the time for me to break down. Have you heard that? Ganahan ako muhilak, pero what can I do? Life demands. Diba? We schedule our breakdowns. Have you heard that? We have to schedule our breakdowns. You go to war? You go to war? Like soldiers, they go to war and then people get shot? Their friends? You can't be like, oh, kaluoy. Ah, you get shot too. No, that's not the time to cry. That's the time to run, to do your thing, to do your skills, right? What you've learned. And then at the end of the war, that's when, you, that's when the mourning comes. That's when you bury the dead, you mourn, you grieve, diba? Right? For others, basta lang a good event, let's party right now. Not always. There are times we have to be sensitive as well. You want to party, but someone's going through a rough time. Maybe now's not the time to talk about, you know. Maybe now's not the time to rub it in on someone. Maybe now's not that, right? So we schedule these things. Ezekiel 24, 16 says, Son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. 
God was saying to Ezekiel he was going to destroy the temple. And he's saying, I'm going to do this thing and it's going to be painful, but you're not supposed to weep. Can you imagine Ezekiel? What? You're going to take away something that was a delight in my heart and I'm supposed to just keep it in? Ano yan? That's hard to do. Organizations assess events. They usually think of when to party, when an event was good, when there's an achievement by the company. We do these things. We also have to decide when to not party. He, uh, Nehemiah 8 verse 9, very interestingly, uh, Nehemiah 8 verse 9, this was when Nehemiah rebuilt the temple. And when they rebuilt the temple, they found the book of the law or the word of God. And they read the word of God to the people during the rebuilding process, okay? And it says in verse 9, Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. So can you imagine that? They're rebuilding the temple. They discover the law. It was read to them and they cried. Why did they cry? They realized just how far they have gone from God, how much they've sinned against God, how much they've offended their Savior. And so they were all weeping because they realized their sin. And God said, no, don't weep, rejoice. Uh -huh. We just found out how we sinned against you. But they misunderstood what God was doing. God had them discover the law and God had them read the law because God was saying, I'm bringing you back into relationship. The reason for the law is because I'm giving you expectations that I have for you. And most of us think, oh, Grabeha, expectations. No, expectations means relationship. If you have no expectations on someone, it's because you have no relationship with someone. You meet a random stranger on the street, you have zero expectations from them. But you have expectations from your parents, your siblings, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your spouse because there's relationship. So God is saying, I'm bringing you back into relationship with me. Why are you weeping? It's time to rejoice. So they misunderstood the intentions of God. And many times we misunderstand seasons as well. We weep when we're supposed to rejoice. We rejoice when we're supposed to weep. No? How about this? A time to cast stones, a time to gather stones together. In context, you know what that means, casting stones? Agricultural man to before. So they would cast the stones into the fields of their enemies so that their enemies cannot plant. They would, it would be harder for them to plant. They have to rake the field again and all of that, okay? So that's uh, one context. A loose application for this, for us today, is this. Maybe there's a season for us to focus on hindering the devil's work in our lives. We cast stones, metaphorically, at the devil's work in our lives. In other words, we look at our lives and we look at sinful patterns. And we say, oh, wait, here's a sinful pattern. I got to stop this. Here's a distraction. I have to stop that. Or maybe it's a time to gather stones together. To gather stones together could mean two things. It could mean building boundaries. And some of you are thinking, ay, ay, I know good asa ang mga boundaries. Now, there are some people in my life. Huh? Not always. It could also mean a building of uh, small, tiny little altars or remembrances for the Lord. In the Old Testament, God never really wanted a gigantic temple to start with. He never said, build a temple for me. In the Old Testament, especially during the patriarchs, all he would say is, gather some stones, put them together, that will serve as a remembrance between a for the covenant between you and me. So there are times when we have to look at what the enemy is doing in our lives. Lord, grabiha no, the, the devil is doing this in my life, putting all these idols in my heart. Allah, the ghana bitaw, I have to remove. But there are other times when we go, I just have to go back to my covenant with the Lord. How have I gotten to know God? How's my relationship with God? Instead of focusing on the, the work of the enemy on my life, I want to focus on the work of God in my life. And there's a time for both. Okay? No extremes. Ha? Always na lang this, always na lang that. There's a time for both. There's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. 
The most obvious application is physical intimacy. Embrace man. If we read the Song of Songs, three times the author warns the reader. Songs chapter 2 verse 7, chapter 3 verse 5, and chapter 5 verse 8 say the exact same thing. He says, I warn you or I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Meaning if I'm not ready, just don't get into it. If you're not ready, don't light that fire because once a fire is lit, oh, it's going to burn and it's going to be hot and it's going to be difficult and self-control will be triple. It's a difficulty. So if you're ready for marriage, get into a relationship, work towards marriage, and then get married. If you're not ready for it, ay na lang sugda kay oh my golly. Okay? So that's really what he's saying in a poetic way. I'm not as poetic. All right, but what are other things that we can think of in terms of embracing and refrain from embracing? It could mean alliances, business partnerships, getting outside help into your life because you don't know what to do with certain areas anymore and you go, I need someone to speak into my life in this area. I will embrace counsel now. It could mean that. It could also mean Comfort or solace in others. You know when tragedy happens, the there is a time that you just want to be alone. Agree? Like people want to give you a hug and you're like, just don't hug me, just leave me alone. And there are times when you go, okay, I need a hug now. Like, bring it in. Diba? Times of embracing, times refraining from embrace. Times where we have to be alone with God. Times where we go into deeper relationships and friendships with others to get that comfort and understanding. How about this? A time to seek slash keep or persist in the seeking or persist in the keeping, meaning you're holding on to something. And there's also a time to cast away or to accept as lost. How many of you have experienced this? It could be trivial cases, right? You... You lost your spare change and you're looking for that maybe 20 peso bill and then you flip the whole room. Ah, sana man tong 20? Diba? Look for something orange, diba? And then finally, you give up. Sige na lang. I'll accept it as lost. Maybe natagak sa taxi. If it's a cell phone, you'll probably look harder. Now, diba? Make it ring. Someone call my phone and then naka-silent man di ay. Ah, <laughs> Diba? Or low bat. Or you listen for a vibration. Diba? You get your bag and then, wala, wala, wala. Okay, next. Asa naman to? So, there are times when we try to seek something. There are times when we have to just accept. Wa na to? Tiwai na. There are times when we insist on having something repaired. And there are times when we say, time to buy a new one. Kay di namada, no matter what. Diba? So, it can be Little things like a paper clip, spare change, an extra ball pen, or it might be a medium thing like a cell phone, or it could be a big thing. You start a business and it's not doing well. How long before you say, let's close it? One year? Two years? Three years? Five years? Ang uban, five years ang negosyo, still, go, still at a loss. Kaya lagi! Dude, <laughs> you know? It could be relationships. <laughs> Yeah, balik ta sa hashtag ha, walang forever. But sometimes it could be relationships, friendships, even romances. We fight more than we, you know, we, our fellowship is composed of nothing more than quote unquote passionate discussions. Diba? Maybe it's time to reconsider. Or it could be goals, hobbies, or interests. This hobby isn't for me anymore, or this goal isn't for me anymore. It's easier if something happens. Like, you know, you have a hobby and then you get into an accident and you're prevented from pursuing that hobby. Uh, then you know the season. But sometimes it's not like that and we have to really consider. Most of the time, actually, it's about our wisdom and our decisions and our maturity to understand what season we're in. Sometimes, it could even be people. We'll dwell a little bit here. Sometimes we have to really keep. Sometimes we have to learn 
to let go, to cast away, and to say, that's done. In church life, this is even more uh, obvious, especially in small churches. It's more obvious. In a small church, we all know each other, right? And because of that, uh, it's just the normal life cycle of a church. When we say loose, the word loose here refers to a ship being tied to the dock, and then you let go of the rope, you un untie the rope so that the ship can sail. Okay, or if you want the waves to take it, put it in. <laughs> no, but it's really to let go of the ship so it can sail and it's no longer at your harbor or dock. No, so in a in a life of a church, the life cycle of any given church, if NCC lasts for twenty years, we're going to experience a lot of losing. It could be because God calls people to be church planters. We've experienced that. Missionaries came. Missionaries went. Uh, and we're so blessed to see their lives abroad, ministering to more people. And what a privilege for us to have had a very tiny role in their lives as they continue to do God's work. So missionaries, church planters, same. Or how about if God calls people to serve in a different locale or country, right? God gives you an opportunity for your career here, and then you've prayed much about it. You look at the churches around. There's a church there. Church needs people. You get in touch with the pastors. You know, and after much prayer, much discussion, deliberation, counsel, God wants you there. It's possible. How about marriage? Or marriage to someone who goes to another church. And you start to wonder, hmm, maybe God wants me to serve there. And as clingy as we are, we shouldn't cling so hard to the point that we miss what God is trying to accomplish in our lives. And you're thinking, we don't know, we don't know, right? And it could be from other circumstances. It could be death, when people pass away. It could be falsehood, when people start holding on to false teaching. Uh, and false teachers or become false teachers, then we have to sadly cast them away, hoping that gra God would grant them repentance so that they would turn from falsehood and come back to the Lord. It could be because of other circumstances or personal re reasons or seasons. Uh, there, there are so many cases and so many exceptions and so many case-to-case -case basis. Every event is also experienced by every member with small, in, within small churches. Why? Proximity. Basic proximity, that's it. You see, in gigantic churches, events are masked. You know why? Here's why. In a gigantic church of 5,000 people, let's say there's a kids' ministry here, it's all kids. There's an adults' ministry all here. There's a seniors' ministry, all the seniors here. So let's say something happens in this part of the church, in a church of 5,000 people. Only this community experiences whatever joy or whatever loss or whatever tragedy. These people don't know what's even happening. All the kids, all they're thinking about is how to study who likes who and who has a crush on who. Usually. All the young adults, all they're thinking of is what's the next career, what's the next... You know, so they don't experience the, the seasons of life of the others. And truth be told, it sounds nice, but it's very sad. Because your growth and maturity is stunted. Think of your family, for example. If you're not in relationship with your biological family, you don't know what's happening in their lives. If you spend more time with your barkada, you don't even know your parents. How many of you honestly can say, I know my parents? How many of you can honestly say this? I can talk about the life of my own dad or my own mom. Now, it's difficult for some because of circumstance. But if you have a chance, spend time with them. Talk to them. Go on a date with them. You want to hear something practical? Call your mom, call your dad. Have coffee with them, and if they ask why, just tell them, I don't need anything, I just want to have coffee. When you sit, you ask them, could you talk to me about your childhood? They'll be like, Haladung, unsay nakauni mo? And you tell them, I just want to get to know you. Try it. You will find out that your parents were just as crazy as you are now. <laughs> okay, so but try it. See where it leads. Build those friendships. 
Okay? But going back, no, with church, it's the same thing. Smaller churches are forced to mature faster because of the different seasons experienced by different people at the same time. And it's a good thing. The question is, how do we respond? Do we respond in faith and contentment when God tells us to lose, let go, or cast away? Or do we respond with, Sakit man kayo, Lord, pwede different na lang? Could you do something else, O God? Is it possible, Lord, I just look for a super, super gigantic church where I'm anonymous? That way, I don't experience anything. I go in, I listen, good sermon, I go home. How will you grow? I'm growing because of the sermon. How, how are your relationships there? Ah, wala lang. I'm what you call a ninja Christian. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Diba? Because we're supposed to have relationships. Other seasons involve this. Should we challenge the flock or comfort the flock in church? Is it a time for a church to focus on evangelism or equipping? Because sometimes, some churches evangelize always na lang. Just don't stop. Keep bringing more people, more people. What about foundations? What about discipleship, doctrine, growth? Later na, just keep soul winning. Go out there. Get more souls. Others naman, it's all about doctrine. What will we evangelize? Doctrine. No, you'll never grow. So we need to balance these things. Is it time for outreach or is it time for internalization? If you think of a rowboat, is it the time to row, to rest, or to realign? Those are some questions we need to ask in our personal lives and as a corporate body, church. Verse 7, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time of peace. To tear in the Old Testament and even some parts of the New Testament, what did they tear? Usually, it was their clothes, their garments. When they sinned against God or when they heard a blasphemy to quote-unquote um, exaggerate or to show how much they don't like something, they will tear their robes. And in some cases, we still feel that way. You know, though sometimes you're like, ah, kainit! <laughs> uh, you know? You're like, ah, Philippines! You know, Why? You know, but really, how many of you have been through so much grief, so much anguish in your life at some point, and you're just so frustrated you want to tear things? Others hair? You pull your hair? Others, you don't want to tear things, you want to smash plates or table flip your whole house. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's mourning, it's anguish. Okay, so severe frustration. There's a time to tear and a time to sow. So some of you, what's happening? So you destroy your room and then there's a time to fix your room after. <laughs> and you go, hi, nako. But really, we go through these seasons. We go through each and every season. There's a time to mourn for our sins. You notice how um, with Peter, for example, he sinned against Christ by denying Christ three times. Remember that? If you notice, how long before Jesus restored Peter? It wasn't like Peter denied Christ. Do you know him? I don't know him. Do you know him? I don't know him. Do you know him? I don't know him. And then right after the third denial, Peter gets a vision from the Lord and Jesus says, I've forgiven you. No. God allowed Peter to go through the whole process of mourning his denials. Can you imagine Peter seeing, seeing Jesus on the shore? And he's probably thinking, ayay. Awkward. <laughs> then they're eating. Can you imagine Jesus eating the fish? I contact Ginagmay. If I'm Peter, I don't know, man. I'd be like looking at Jesus when Jesus got me to Anna. You know, like, oh, I still feel a little guilty. I hope he forgot. He's offering the Lord more fish. <laughs> I mean, really, what did God do? Jesus allowed Peter to go through the mourning of sin. It is the same with us. God allows us to go through certain seasons in life when we have sin. Padayun lang. And then, Lord, when will your comfort come? Nagganiharam ako gahilak. Dehydrated na ko, Lord. And God's just like, 
You need to feel it a little bit more. You know, why? God doesn't just instantly for let you experience comfort. There are also times when the sin is so great and then God gives you comfort immediately. And you're wondering, Lord, no, I need to feel it more. Diba? And you're trying to condemn yourself, ba? Kuang pa, I need more. And God's saying, no, 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 that already works. I'm showing you grace right now. You need to get grace. I'm like, no, no, later na, Lord. Like, let me work on it pa. Sometimes it's like that, no? Sometimes we need to be silent, a time to be silent. And there are times when we need to speak. Which means there are times when we need to expose sin. So we need to speak. There are times when we should be silent pa. It's difficult if we just see sin all the time. We just keep exposing nonstop, diba? Right? We will hate ourselves and we will hate one another. Ang ending ana. God doesn't expose all your sins at the same time. Can you imagine you're praying? Oh Lord, how do you want me to change? Okay, you really want to know my son? Here's a list. <laughs> Patay! Diba? Right? Lord, joke lang. God doesn't tell us everything at the same time. He gives us little by little, bit by bit. God is speaking to us in some areas of our lives and silent in others. And we need to have that same God-like wisdom when we treat ourselves and when we treat others. Diba? So a, a, time to, a time for us to have private meditation, a time for public correction. Okay, There's even, in a sense, remember Job? When Job went through grief, God allowed him to murmur. God could have stopped Job in chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, but no. God allowed him several chapters to complain. God, why? God, why this? Why that? Oh God, grab me. Of all that. And then Job went from philosophical, emotional, rational. And God was just like, Sige, padayon. But in the end, okay Job, my turn. So time for you to be quiet. Time for me to speak. And Job's like, oh, wait, wait. Di, di na ko, Lord. Okay na ko. First sentence pa lang, Job already said, I surrender. And God said, no, 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 no. I'm gonna continue. And it's time for you to listen now. And we go through that. We have to learn. A time, to lo a time for love, a time for hate, a time for peace, a time for war. You know, there's our, there are touching stories of World War I and World War II. Okay, Karun Mangod World War, it's just you press a button, a nuclear missile flies, and then the war is over. No? But before, it lasted years. And there were some times, in, you can read this, research this, World War II especially, soldiers, like the Germans and the Americans, they were shooting at each other, killing each other, okay? And they were encamped for many, many months. Niabutman of Christmas. The heads of the German camp and the American camp, they met and they said, ceasefire, ha? Christmas. And they all agreed, ceasefire. And the weird part, and you can Google this, they'd have hot chocolate with one another. They would sing, sing Christmas carols. And there was even a touching moment where uh, I think it was the American side that started singing Christmas carols first, very loudly. And then the Germans on the other side sang the same carol in their own language, Dungan. And you're like, can you imagine trying to kill each other after that? It's so, time for peace, time for war. And you're like, peace na pwede, peace na lang always. Right? So it's, but that's the complexity of life. There are forces beyond our control. Because there's a time for so many different things, to semi-conclude, we have to avoid extremes. We have to avoid extremes because there are some people that are always in the same season and they never change. Some people, it's, they want to keep reap, reaping but never planting. I just want to keep reaping, reap, 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 but I never invest, I never plant, I never exert effort, wala. That shows greed. Some people always just want to keep breaking but they're never building. I want to break this, break that. You know, always contrarian. I disagree with this, disagree with that, disagree with everything. Maybe there's anger in the heart. Some always want to plant, but they never uproot. In other words, they always start something, they never finish things. Okay? Maybe these are people who are afraid of commitment or afraid of conclusions. Some never mourn and always laugh. 
You know people like that? Something bad happens. Ay na lang, ano, binuang man na. Just, you know, let's just have fun. Let's watch a movie. Ay na na, don't think about it. You have friends like those? Or are you that? You don't want to deal, so just, idalik ka tawa. Madarag smile. Next. Okay, maybe it's because these people have no real commitments. Some always gather, they never cast away. Hoarders, for example. You know, ang dilata from 1981 na until karun. No? Wow. No? Or ka ng mga butanganan, those metallic, ano? And you look, oh wow, biscuits! When you open it, kay sewing kit. <laughs> okay, so hoarders sometimes, no? Maybe there's a fear of the future or lack of faith that God would provide. How about this? Too quick to let go, very slow to persist. It's like Marie Kondo all the time. Throw this, throw that, throw this, throw that. Grab in a man. That's also scary because that means you have a very um, low value or you put a very low value on things. Okay? Some have too much love. Others have too much hate. Too much hate is you're a heresy hunter and all you see is heresy in people. Just too much hate all the time. Hate, 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 hate. Hate falsehood. Others someone too much love. That guy is preaching false doctrine. It's okay. Too much love. So some too much hate, some too much love, no? So we avoid extremes because the truth is this. Extremes simply reveal heart conditions. Because patterns are just heart responses. That's really what they are. Our patterns are just heart responses. And if we're an extreme in some area, it's because we have our heart condition set in that certain area when we should learn wisdom and balance things out. Now, when we went through everything, did you feel the frustration of not knowing, not having the wisdom to do A or B? You're thinking, Bitao, no, I don't know when to do this or that, a time for this, a time for that. Ambot lang. I just don't know when. I make mistakes all the time. I'm always ill-timed. Why is that? But that's okay. It's normal and it's actually good that you're frustrated. If you're frustrated, it's because you want wisdom. And that's a good thing. It's better than saying, I'm not frustrated at all because life is life. But that means you're apathetic and you don't want to grow. So it's good that you want wisdom. You know, sometimes friends say, wow, perfect timing ka bro. Have you heard that? You do something and your friend goes, you have no idea how timely that is for me. And you're like, wow, I had wisdom there, but actually no. <laughs> Chamba lang. <laughs> no? Really the truth is, most of the time, we say things like, I should have done this, I should have said that, I should have been this, I should have been that. How do we resolve this? How do we live in the tension of knowing when to do what with whom? What do we do? Well, we're going to conclude verse 9. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Yes, there's tension. We cannot really know when to do this or that in season this or season that. The answer, we're not supposed to try to make sense of everything. That's not the point. God gave us this not because he wants us to become so wise that we know what to do. Because we'll never get that wisdom. The wisdom is not in trying to make perfect decisions, but to accept that God is the one who's wise. That's the whole point of this. If you accept that God is sovereign and in control, then you are wise. If you try to be perfect in getting that wisdom to know when to do what, you're actually being foolish. That's the point of this chapter. The NET... Uh, New English translation says verse 11 differently. He says it this way. God has made everything 
fit beautifully in its appropriate time. And he has placed ignorance in the human heart so that people cannot discover what God has ordained from the beginning to the end of their lives. Meaning, God is sovereign, we're not, we're temporary, and everything fit beautifully in its time. And you're wondering, even the bad stuff? Even the painful stuff? But actually, here's the truth. We only think something is bad because of our own standards. But if we look at God's standards, and we can't really see it, and it's by faith that we believe God's purposes and will is perfect, then everything is beautiful. Because God's will is perfect, then everything is okay. Everything is appropriate. Everything fits beautifully. Use your imagination for a moment. Every fruit that falls in a forest that you cannot see. Imagine a forest. Imagine the trees that fall. Imagine the fruits that fall that we don't see, that nobody can see. They all fell in the right, perfect places. Every unburied seed, every buried seed. In this room, when we turn off the lights and no one is here, there are dust particles. Everything that's happening here right now is also fitting according to God's time. Okay, so everyone relax, right? But think about it for a moment. When this room is empty, there will be dust particles falling, right? Even those fit accordingly, according to God's time. Every person talking, every noise that happens, if the air conditioner turns off or the other air conditioner makes noises right here during the sermon, it's fine. It's fine. It's all according to God's purpose. God is teaching all of us something. For some patience, for some humor, for some acceptance, right? Every bacteria in our body and what they're doing right now that is invisible to us, that's according to his time. Every atom in the universe. I read on Facebook that a meteor thou, the size of a small country might hit Earth next month. Well, Facebook keeps saying those things, no? But Colossians 1.17 says that Christ is before all things and in him all things hold together. So I'm confident that whatever meteor that is, no matter how big that is, it's not going to hit earth. Why? Jesus. That's why. Everything is under his control. Every thought that goes to your mind, every emotion that goes to your heart, and every action or non-action you do because of it, that's still subject to God's control. Think about this for a moment. You have thoughts in your mind, right? You have emotions in your heart. There are certain thoughts out there that you're not thinking of. What they are, we don't know because you're not thinking of them. <laughs> but whatever they are, God did not allow them to enter your mind. Whatever feelings you have in your heart, whether you're thinking, I'm hungry, I want to eat, or where should I go after, you know, these things. Or I'm so encouraged, or I'm so confused, or I'm frustrated, whatever emotions you have. There are some emotions that are not in your heart now. God did not allow those to enter. So every thought, even every emotion, they're still under the sovereignty of God. And everything we do because of those thoughts and emotions are still under the sovereignty of God. Every wise decision, unwise decision, when you hurt others, when you hurt yourself, it's all under God. Verse 11 says, Eternity or ignorance is in our hearts so that we cannot discover what God ordained. Everything's ordained. What does this mean? It means we long for eternity. We want to know from point A to point B. We want to know what's going to happen in the future so I know where to invest today. I want to know what to do, what I could have done in the past to avoid certain issues today. All these things. But you know, it's up to God. The immediate context of this verse actually says this. The eternity in our hearts. You know what God is really saying there? Eternity in our hearts. He's saying, think about it for a moment. Your life is maybe what? 80 years? 90? If you're very, very healthy, 110 years? And God is from eternity to eternity. So God is saying, I put that longing in your heart to know so that you will realize that you won't ever know. Okay? I know it sounds weird. I'm putting it in your heart to desire this 
to desire knowledge so that you'll realize that you won't know so that you would depend on God. Who knows? That's the whole point of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's this tension of striving, striving to be wise and being content with our limitations because God is in control. And so we must also learn to accept the past. The tendency is we don't accept the past. We blame. Agree? We, we play the blame game all the time like Adam and Eve. Whenever bad things happen, here's what we do. First, we blame either people uh, close to us or people far from us. Childhood, diba? My childhood was like this. My, my family was like that. We blame people, childhood. We blame our environment. Our environment, you know, I, I was not raised in an environment of this and that. I was not born under this family or that family. And then we blame our physiology. You know, I don't have certain skills, Mangod. You know, I wasn't born with like big bone structures or whatever, right? I wish I had a longer hair or <laughs> whatever. Well, physiology. You guys are giggling, huh? How about this? We blame psychology. I, I, don't, I don't have the coping mechanisms for this or that or whatever. We keep blaming when in fact, instead of blaming, we should learn to simply accept the sovereignty of God and be content with what God has given us and to continue to strive to please Him. But instead of blaming, we say, I don't want to blame, I want to do something different. I'm just going to get human or humanistic, man-centered coping methods. Many of us do that instead, no? We look for man-centered, secular, human ways to cope instead of looking at the sovereignty of God. Verse 12. We're almost done. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God, God seeks what has been driven away. What does this mean? First, look at verse 12. He says, joyful and do good. Joyful, be content, do good, strive. See the balance? We strive, we do what we can. If it doesn't happen, contentment. And then we strive again, contentment again. Ano lang? Don't be like, oh, sayang ato eh, nani, nana. No need. Our problem is that we're greedy. In success, we wish for more. In tragedy, Tragedy, we wish for none. No? In terms of investments, I talk to some people, and as investment goes up, let's say 5%, di pwede 10, saya nga eh. When it hit 10, saya nga wak mag 20 eh. Pag 20, sus grabiha, 80 na unta ato. Like what? <laughs> and then, kung mo negative gamay, kay grabi sa, pwede positive na lang, maski zero. <laughs> what do you want? You see, God allows us in delighting in His mercies and gifts, but not in abusing them by idolizing or misusing them. There's that balance of striving and then contentment. Without that, we're going to pierce ourselves with many griefs. When we try to rush or delay seasons, we end up hurting ourselves and we hurt others. Let's talk about that for a moment lang. What are some things that we try to rush or delay? Let's take a look. Business or careers. Hire me now. How come I'm not hired? It's been three months. Wapagihapon, pagihapon. All these companies, what are they thinking? Huh? We try to rush or we delay. Your parents say, isn't it time for you to start applying? Dili pa, kay, you know, it's time for me to rest pa. One year naman dung. <laughs> Okay? Others naman try to rush financial security. And we've heard of the scams that is going around on Facebook. Ganahan paspas insta fix sa pitaka. Ang ending insta bankrupt most of the time. Impulse purchases. I like it, but I don't have money, pero look, sale. 
Ha? Suddenly, a time for purchasing. <laughs> okay, so be careful. Romance and marriage. Nitanaw lang og ka ng romantic comedy. Ay, ay, ganahan ako. Well, now na. Di ba? Or others, marriage. I need to get married. When? Yesterday. Okay? Be careful. Promotions. How about that? I need to get promoted. When? Karun na. Wapagay ka na regular. Promotion na. <laughs> these, th these things go through processes. How about comforts in life? Maybe it's not at a time to be comfortable. Maybe I need to invest in my career first, in my business first, and then maybe I can do vacations later on. Okay? Samang good. Nag-work lang gamay. I deserve a vacation. Stressed kay ko. Oh, careful. Okay? Paying debts and making debts. Is this a good time to borrow money because there's this opportunity or maybe not muna? Or maybe I should pay my debt asap. Ang uban mang good kay ganahan mang utang di mo bayad. Ang uban naman, ganahan na mo bayad. Pero there's something up with you have to kanang other opportunities or priorities you have to first consider ba? Okay? So we need to be wise in all those things. Here's a good saying that we've read months ago. My, uh, we were thinking of some personal issues in our lives and we went across this one sentence that really spoke to us and here it is. What you don't have now, you don't need now. And we were like, wow, amen, kaayo. What God has ordained will surely come to pass. We cannot add or subtract to them. That's the whole point of predestination. So why do we pray, why do we work, and why do we hope? If God ordained it, He will do it, why pray? Why work? Why hope? But think about it for a moment. Why pray? Who put that burden in your heart to pray in the first place? It's God. Why work? Well, who put that skill in your hands? Why hope? Who put that idea in your mind? It's all still God. You notice, of all the people in the world, there are certain people you're praying for and certain people you're not praying for. Who put that burden in your heart to pray for A, B, and C and not Z, Y, and X? Diba? And don't we feel pleasure when we commune with God? Don't we feel fulfillment in our efforts? Don't we feel satisfied in when, when hope is fulfilled? So it's not useless. We still enjoy the mercies of God. So it's not like we're robots. We have emotions. We still enjoy. We feel. When verse 15 says God seeks what has been driven away, the context of that is God planned stuff in the past. It's been driven away from our thoughts. We don't know what they are. God will be the one to do it or seek it for us. And then He will reveal it in its proper time. In other words, it's like saying, God, I don't know your will for me tomorrow. And then God made a decision and a will for you for tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, God will reveal it to you. Here was my will for you, which I have planned in eternity past. And you go, oh. That's essentially what it means. God ordained everything. So to conclude, we live in a fallen earth. There will be tragedies, big decisions, regrets. There's uncertainties in life. But we need wisdom for all of them in our personal lives, in our church, as a body. How do we deal with them? Well, first, here's how we don't deal with them. We don't, here's how we should not deal with them. And it's by trying to get control, wrestling control from God. We strive, yes, but let's not try to be sovereign. Many times we want control, omnipotence, we want information, omniscience. In other words, we want to be like God. Sounds familiar? Genesis, no? The snake. Let's not try to do that. We are mortal, we are limited, we are dependent. So instead of trying to wrestle control, let's simply trust. Let's have faith. Let's acknowledge that He is in control, that He is sovereign. And when, when we get to know God more, it will be easier. Have you heard of the phrase, it's not about religion, but relationship? Have you heard that? You know that's not biblical. It's not biblical, huh? What is religion? Religion is a set of super or spiritual beliefs about spirituality. That's religion. Christianity is a religion. 
But Christianity is the only religion where we get relationship with our God. So Christianity is a religion and a relationship. Okay? And the more we get to know God, the more we deepen our relationship with God through His Word, the more we realize that God loves us, God ordained all events, that He is in control, and that He will glorify Himself, the more we can rest. For those of you who have kids, or for those of you who know your parents quite well, when you were young, did you need to know how your parents provided for you? No, di ba? Like, you just knew there's going to be food on the table tonight. You didn't have to call your dad and say, Dad, how does your job work? And then your dad says, why are you asked? I want to know how your job works so I can ensure that there's dinner tonight. <laughs> Anyone? Wala, no? No one did that. Because you had relationship with your parents, you just knew. You just trusted them. We strive, we do what we can. When they say, do your chores, we do our chores. But in the end, you know, because your parents love you, there's provision. How's your relationship with God? So this life, it's a cycle. We strive. Some tragedies happen. It's fine. We express. Oh Lord, why? Like Job. Just know God will respond. Okay? But we ask God, Lord, no money. We strive. We strive. There's tragedy. We express. And then we learn to trust. Have faith in Him. After faith and trust, we begin to accept. Maudi ay Lord. Okay. Okay na ko Lord. And then we learn. After we learn, we move forward, we mature more. Based on our maturity, we strive wisely. Or we strive, sorry, we strive more wisely. Tragedy again. And then it's a cycle. And it's fine. What's important is we have a relationship with the Lord. And that's how it all comes together. This whole tension, it's okay to be frustrated. Just to end, this all began with a time to be born and a time to die. There's also a time to be born again. Which means if you guys are here, and I'm talking about relationship with God, many times what people have is religion, but no relationship. It's just religion. I know, I know facts about Jesus, born in a manger, 12 disciples, crucified, betrayed by Judas, died on the cross. All religion, but no relationship. Others man, are all relationship, but no religion. In other words, no right doctrine. I love Jesus. Which Jesus? Basta Jesus. I love God. Which God? All gods. So it's all quote-unquote relationship, but really no religion, no doctrine, no, no truth. There's a balance. Again, there's a balance. So if you're here and you don't have relationship with Jesus, all you have is religion, meaning I know facts, but I've never trusted in Christ for my salvation. I've never put my full weight of faith that it's Jesus who will save me, not my good works, not my moral living, not my, my confessions and my sacraments and all of that, we invite you to please, let's talk some more, let's have lunch together. But really, my, our invitation is not to talk to us, but first, talk to the Lord. Settle it in your heart with God. Go to Him and say, Lord, I don't I haven't put my faith in you. I still believe my good works will save me, my good deeds, I'm a nice guy. Like, just let go of that. The Bible says very clearly, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not by works. How can we think that our good deeds can merit eternity? 120 years of good deeds with a lot of sin on earth equals eternity in heaven? Impossible. It's just not math. But Jesus, who is eternal, paid for our sins on the cross. So you've got an eternal God paying for eternity of forgiveness for us to experience eternity with Him. That's the gospel. That's the good news. So in the end, as much as we want wisdom, the wisest thing to do first is to have relationship with the Lord, not just religion. Go to Him. Talk to him. And if you want to learn more about that, talk to us also. Amen? Let's pray.